Hello, everyone. My name is Audrey, Aubrey Mormon, and I'd like to start by telling you a little bit about my background. I'm sitting in front of cream-colored white walls. I've got a number of objects framed behind me. I'm also one of the students at CDDA, the Center for Democracy in Deaf America. I'm also co-facilitator for tonight's historic event. It is our first ever Youth Debate Bowl. We have two topics to be debated this evening. The first one is whether homework should be abolished in middle school. And then we'll see a debate about whether or not the voting age should be lowered to 16. I'm honored to be one of your moderators tonight alongside my esteemed and talented colleague, Lexi Hill. Thank you for your kind words, Aubrey. My name is Lexi Hill. And first I'd like to give my image description. I am a woman and I'm wearing a dark blue polo with a gray cardigan. I have brown hair and I'm sitting in front of a window with white blinds behind me. And just like Aubrey mentioned, I am also a part of CDDA and I am the other moderator for tonight's event. And we are so excited to be a part of this event to encourage um, young deaf students to engage in debates. It is such a healthy form of practice that we've been engaging in CDDA and we are envisioning to develop health, a healthy democratic skill of debating, civil engagement, and many other skills that are important. One last thing before we begin, we will have two polls. We'll be doing one at the beginning of the debate. And then again, after the last debaters present and close to see if our debaters are able to actually persuade you to change your position on the two topics that we'll be discussing tonight. You'll find our poll in the comments. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce our judges tonight. Please come to the screen. So let's begin with Zainab. Zainab? Hello, my name is Isadora Nayagabi, and I am president of National Black Deaf, Black Deaf Association for the Deaf, and I am thrilled to be here with you all today. I am a Black man with a white shirt with uh, gray buttons. I have glasses, and behind me in my background is a white wall with two framed pictures that have just fall landscaping on them. Thank you. Thank you for that, Isidore. Zainab? Yes, hello everyone. My name is Zainab Akalespi, and I have dark curly hair, glasses. I have olive toned skin. I'm wearing a black shirt with an NAD logo and a black sweater. I'm in my home office, which has half gray walls and half white walls. And there's an empty shelf behind me as we are moving. <laughs> so who I am and a little bit about me is I am working with policy for the Policy Council for NAD, the National Association for the Deaf. And I am honored to be one of the judges here today for this debate that is, that is hosted by the Center for Democracy and Deaf America program and Gallaudet Youth Program. So I'm really excited that I get to hear these four debaters and watch them and see how they agree and disagree with one another. Wonderful, thank you, Zainab. And finally, let's turn to Kim to introduce herself. Thank you. So my name is Kim Bianco Majiri. I am a white female with dark brown hair I have a black shirt on with an NAD logo with a black 
sweater and I have a black background. I am the State Legislature Affairs Coordinator for the National Association for the Deaf. I worked with I work with Zanab, and it's also an honor to be one of the three judges today for this debate. And I look forward to the debate. So, will one of you like to share how you'll be judging tonight? Okay, this is an app. I will explain. So before we get started for the judging, these are the areas that we're going to be judging on. I want to share what our rubric is going to be that we're looking for. So to be clear, this is not about our personal opinions about the issues, but specifically about these particular criteria in the rubric. First is the overarching big picture. This is Kim. Civility, we'll be looking for civility with one another. This is Zanab. The use of a compelling evidence. This is Kim. Storytelling. This is Zanab. Strategic reasoning to opponents and judges' questions. This is Kim. Passion and strength. And this is Zanab. And finally, based on these criteria, the three of us will then compare our scores and vote on who would be the winner for that particular debate. I can't wait to watch and see what comes of tonight and to see who ends up on top. So on that note, I'm going to turn it back over to Aubrey so we can get things started. Great, thank you so much, judges. All right, thanks again to our three outstanding judges. Next up, Lexi and I are going to talk to you about the format for tonight's matches. We'll begin with a three minute opening from the affirmative side, followed by the negative. After the negative opening, then the affirmative will have an opportunity to give a three minute rebuttal, excuse me, rebuttal, followed by the negative. And then we will have about a minute and a half break to simply give the debater some time to prepare questions for the crossfire. The negative debater will ask first and the affirmative will have about a minute to answer that question and then the affirmative debater will then turn around and ask the negative debater a question as well. After the cross-examination, we'll have the judges come back out and present their question for each of the debaters. This means there might be one or two, one apiece or one for both of them. They then will wrap up with closing arguments from each the affirmative and the negative. And the judges will also give their feedback. I've watched them uh, prepare and I have to say that I'm really looking forward to what's in store with us. I uh, took a look at their preparations in the virtual locker room, if you will, and I've got to say, I hope you have your popcorn ready. And before we get started, I do hope that you will all participate in the pre-debate poll as well. Okay, let's start. Are you ready? I definitely am. We're going to start off with Jonah Abenshaman from Maryland School for the Deaf, who will be arguing the affirmative side that homework should be abolished in middle school. And then Matea King from Kendall will be arguing the negative side that homework should continue to be available for students in school. I'd like to invite them now. Hi. Are you guys ready? Well, why don't we go ahead and start and let each of you introduce yourselves uh, and also do an image description in order to support accessibility. 
Hi, my name is Jonah. I am a white male and I'm wearing a white short with a white background and a mirror to the left of me. And I have brown Great. hair. Thank you, Jonah. Hi everyone. I'm Matea King. I am um, a brown skinned woman wearing glasses and I'm standing in front of a green screen. Good luck, Jonah. And good luck to you. All right, fantastic. So thank you both for coming this evening. We're really excited to see your debate. Are you both ready? Yeah, very ready. All right, well then let's get binning. Get, get ready to get started. Good luck to you both. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and start now. Jonah, you're gonna go first, are you ready? I'm ready. All right, so the timer is gonna start as soon as you start signing. Hello. I've gone to school at the Florida School for the Deaf and it would require me to get up very early in the morning to then get on the bus to travel one hour to get to school. Spend eight hours a day from 8.30 to 3.30 at school then take another one hour bus trip back home. And of course I would want to go and play outside as soon as I get home, but my parents would not let me because I had homework. So I would then spend 30 minutes to an hour, depending on the homework, doing my homework. And when I was done with that, I would still want to go outside and play, but that was when dinner started. And after dinner, it is now dark and I still couldn't go out to play. So because of homework, I wasn't able to do that. I do think that homework should be abolished for middle school. And the reason is, is because you have less family time, less time with your friends, less time to spend with your pets or play sports. It's overwhelming for kids to have homework in school. And family time is something that we should value because we create memories with our families, which is so important. Socializing with your friends is also important because that helps you to develop social skills. Spending time with your pets is also important, but when you're having to juggle homework, you can't do that. It will conflict with sports because you cannot practice with sports every day and do your homework. Also, you can't participate in those sports games. That creates a lot of anxiety for kids. My third reason is that kids will get overwhelmed after spending eight hours a day at school and the fact is, is that 82% of students feel overwhelmed with the amount of schoolwork. Now, 70% of those students are overwhelmed with homework. So 82% are overwhelmed with schoolwork and then 70% of that 82% is also overwhelmed with schoolwork. And research shows that many parents also agree that children should not have homework because they should be able to spend time as children, have less stress, be less overwhelmed and enjoy their lives. Thank you. Good job, Jonah. Okay, great, Jonah. Perfect. All right. Matea, are you ready for your opening? I'm nervous, but yes, I'm ready. Okay, so the timer will start as soon as you start signing. Okay, okay. I'm in favor of keeping homework for middle schooler and not abolishing it. I'll start by saying that when education began first in the first century AD, the focus was to develop confidence. Our current educational system was started by Horace Mann in the 19th century, and the intent was to focus on the three R's. Now in 2021, we have a newly elected presidential administration and a new secretary of education, Miguel Cardona. He's focusing on reforming education. He has a very strong commitment to equity and making sure that the educational system supports teachers and students to make sure that our system is more of what people need. Here are my three main reasons for keeping homework. It opens your mind. As a personal example, I'll say the kids are pretty self-centered. We only want to do what we want to do. And if left to our own devices, we would probably never want to do homework. When I was in sixth grade, I had no interest in studying Greek history. I thought it was boring. 
but I've now come to love it. And I can only imagine that in future, if in future parts of my life, when I have a job, I might have a responsibility that I'm not interested in doing, but I need to learn to do that. It also helps us develop different life skills and to understand that it's okay to make mistakes and to learn from mistakes and that it's a way to grow and it's an op homework provides an opportunity for that. Research also shows that we forget about 50% of what we've learned during the class day. Homework is a good opportunity to reinforce what we've learned during the day. And the homework isn't something brand new. Kids shouldn't feel lost when they're doing their homework. It should be a refresher or review of what we've done in class that day. Now, as another personal example, I never was a big fan of math. And we had to do an online assignment for our math class. And some might look at math assignments as something that's just limited to school, but it really teaches us other life skills because eventually when I earn my own money, I'll be able to manage my money, buy a house, clothes, whatever I need to do. So there are real life skills that homework helps us develop. Research also shows that kids who do homework do 69% better than kids who don't do homework, more than half. I think that when kids have other things to occupy their time, like homework, then they don't have as much opportunity to do other things that might get them into trouble. So I think that homework keeps kids on the right track. So these are my three main reasons for why I think that we should keep homework in middle school. It opens kids' minds, leads them to new interests, it pertains to life skills, and it can help them achieve better GPAs. Are you done? I am. All right, thank you. So now we're gonna go back for the rebuttal. Jonah, are you ready? I'm very ready. All right, go ahead and get started. I'm wondering how you can explain this. If 82% of students are overwhelmed with their schoolwork and 70% of those students are overwhelmed with their homework, is that a good experience for them to have? And if you have so much stress, it does have several negative impacts. It impacts your sleep. It also can impact their ability to stay awake and pay attention during their class time. Stress also does not allow for students to think clearly and coherently. I think it's very important to participate in sports because being overloaded with homework doesn't allow for students to have some kind of physical exercise. That's not a good experience for students to have as well. Being a part of sports allows for people to be physical and get exercise, uh, to spend time with their family and their friends, all very important. Being stuck inside doing homework doesn't allow for students to meet new people. It also would take them several hours to do the homework and less time to spend time with their family and enjoy some of the other benefits. And that is the reason why I think homework should be banned. All right, great. Thank you, Jonah. Matea, whenever you're ready for your rebuttal. Jonah, you said that we need to spend more quality time with our families and that homework occupies too much of our time. I think that we can also reform the educational system, as I mentioned, our current Secretary of Education will do. So homework doesn't have to dominate your entire school day. It can be done on the weekend. Weekends are known to be time to relax and spend time with your friends and family, but you can do things with your family during the week as well. We also know that parents work during the week as well. Kids also have to learn how to balance the responsibilities that we have. So of course, sports are very important and athletics, but we need to also make sure that we balance all that we do. The time that we need to spend on our education is really key to being able to get good jobs like our parents. And not only that, you mentioned that we, hold on. You mentioned that we need to spend quality time with our family. And of course, that's very important. But please remember that you just said that what 82% of kids say that they're overwhelmed with classwork and 70% aren't. Why not reduce the classwork that that 82% has? Or excuse me, the homework. Miguel Cordano states that many students don't have access to resources, after school tutoring, et cetera, things like that. So why not? bring in homework to using that during our class time. So 
just because someone is overwhelmed with something doesn't mean that that's the only way to do it or that it's not worth doing. Okay. Thank you, Matea. So now we're going to have a one minute break, give you both some time to develop your crossfire questions. So actually you have a minute and 30 seconds. So you guys can turn your screen off while you're thinking of your questions. Wow. I know, yeah, I was really impressed with what I've seen so far. So I'm curious to see what kind of crossfire they're gonna come up with. Yeah, same, I was wondering the same. For those of you who are out there watching, you may be wondering what the intent behind the crossfire is. So the crossfire questions is to allow opportunity to find weak spots in a person's argument. Uh, the goal is to dismantle their argument. It can be used to point out uh, certain flaws in their argument, and that will give some visibility to the judges for other considerations. And I mean, crossfires are essentially your way of getting back in the game sometimes. Very true. Definitely in my experience, that's been true. And I'd say that this is the most exciting part of, um, of our debates. So I will ask both debaters to come back on screen now. Matea, Jonah, come on back. Hello. Jonah, perfect, okay. And who goes first in the crossfire, me or Jonah? So now Jonah will ask Matea, a crossfire question, an affirmative question, and then you'll have a minute and 30 to answer. And then whatever time is left of that time, you will have to then ask Jonah a question. And so you can ask and answer within your one minute 30. Wait, so. Excellent. So you mentioned that we could change the school system and the setting of the school day. Uh, to relieve some of that stress. But what if that's not possible? There could be other different ways of teaching that we could also consider. But if that's not possible, then how do you still relieve some of that stress? Uh, some schools will be willing to change the structure of their school day, but other schools wouldn't. So how would you achieve that? Well, you mentioned that different schools have different, uh, students have different ways of coping with stress and not every school is run the same way. There's different ways of reducing stress, many of which are beneficial to us. You can talk to teachers about the amount of schoolwork that, or homework that they assign. Let's say, for example, they just adjust the due date or maybe don't have the homework every single day. They might assign it one day of the week, let's say on Mondays, and then it would be due later in the week, Thursdays or Fridays. So you can manage your time as you see fit during the week to spend time with your family or play sports. All right, so now your question is done, Jonah. So now Matea will have an opportunity to ask you a question. How can students develop their confidence if they don't remember the things that they learn in class by having homework? Sorry, I'll restate the question. So how can students develop confidence if say, for example, they skip class or they weren't paying attention in class or forget because students develop, or excuse me, forget 50% of what they learn in class if it's not reinforced by homework? I think that if students are skipping class, then they have to be a part of the after school program. I don't think that if they're paying attention during class, that should be part of the consideration. Every student should pay attention during class because that's what school is designed to do is for us to learn. It's really their responsibility to pay attention in class and get the good grades. If they don't get a good grades, then that could be a lesson learned for them to pay attention. Okay. Great, I think those were good questions that both of you asked. Thank you both for your responses and for your questions. Now we're gonna have another break for you all to prepare for your closings and then for the judges to come up with their questions that they're going to ask you. So you all may turn your screens off. Hello. All right. Yeah, so I didn't see those questions coming. Me either, but I'm glad that we got them. I agree. 
All right, so let's take a moment and tell the audience what to expect to see and what the recent um, segment was just about. Well, actually, before we do that, I want to explain a little bit about judges' questions and what these judges' questions are doing. So the judges are going to have an opportunity to ask both debaters certain questions. Maybe they want a clarification on something that they had stated or bringing up new points or maybe finding the hole in their argument. Really, the judges can ask anything that they feel like they want to. And the debaters need to be ready for those questions. So with that being said, hopefully our judges are ready for their questions. And we'll have the judges and the debaters back on screen, please. I'll give everyone just a few more moments. Oh, of course. So judges' questions are often quite fascinating. So far, we've seen some wonderful points that have been made by our debaters. Right. I mean, from in my experience so far with the judges' questions, I find them the hardest questions because it's based on a wealth of experience that they have and their knowledge. So the judges use the rubric also that they're judging the debaters against and they ask their questions very strategically. So we'll see how the debaters use this segment to perhaps sway the judge's interest in certain points. And I think often, you know, we as debaters, we have what we have a confirmation bias. You know, we feel that our argument is solid, that we're focused, and we know what the other side is going to say, but for the judges, well, I'm sure that they will have that unbiased opinion as much as possible with their perspective, and they'll be able to weigh the scales that way. You know, this debate now is their opportunity to figure out where the scares, scales are going to go, Jonah or Matea. Right. And then as Zainab mentioned earlier, this isn't based on their personal opinions. It truly isn't. It's based yeah. on those criteria. It's how it's presented, exactly. Right, and I think that's the hard, hardest job of all. Yeah, I'm not looking forward to the day that I have to be a judge for a debate. Mm -mm. Not at all. Yeah, no, I don't envy them. Me either. I think there's some really interesting points that both of our debaters made so far regarding homework or abolishing homework. So I'm really curious to see how that's going to go. I hope that the judges are ready and they're ready to pop on. Maybe they aren't. <laughs> well, um, so I guess we just sort of vibe for a little bit longer <laughs> and you and I get to be the stars of the show. Don't tell the debaters. Right, right, exactly. Okay, so I've got a question for you. How did you feel about having the opportunity to host this first ever Youth Bowl debate? Honestly, I'm honored. I really am. I'm honored to be here this evening because it's an opportunity for our young kids to, to do something that, honestly, that they do on a daily basis, but for free. You know, I mean, they're always arguing with parents or, you know, negotiating whether to clean their room now or later or what. Oh, oh perfect. The judges are now. here. Debaters, will you come back, please? All right. Matea, Jonah. All right. Great. This is an app. Thank you all for your opening statements, your rebuttal and your crossfire questions. So now it's the time for the three of us judges to ask you some questions. We're gonna start with uh, Jonah and Isidore has a question for you. So, hi Jonah. Hi. Wow, that was a wonderful debate. Do you believe that social growth is important and how do you support academic growth and social growth? Can you repeat that question, please? Oh, okay, sure. Hi, Jonah, can you see me? Okay.
it looks like I'm freezing. Let maybe see if I can slow down a little bit. So your argument was emphasizing social and emotional growth and indicating that that was important. How does that influence academic growth? I think that it affects your academic growth a lot because it allows for you to in, be involved in different things like battle of the books, debate teams like this. And I think that you are learning how to do things like answer questions and debate with your peers when you are hanging out with them socially. And if I didn't have that social skill, I wouldn't join the battle of the books, which what I recently did. And I wouldn't be here with the debate team. Um, these are skills that I learned hanging out with my friends socially. So I think it, it affects my academic growth a lot. Thank you for the question. Okay, great. Thank you, Jonah. So now for Matea, your argument emphasized the importance of homework and studying and retaining knowledge in order to develop your intellect. How can you help to balance with the social emotional growth based on that? You just said that I emphasized intellectual development and how we need to balance that with our social lives. I think when we struggle with our homework, we naturally sometimes will reach out to our friends. We'll ask for help. We'll ask our teachers for help. So for example, as a personal experience, I often didn't reach out to friends over text. I am really sort of a solo learner and I perhaps was a little overconfident, but then when it came to math homework, a friend reached out to me who I really barely, I ended up reaching out to a friend who I barely talked to in math class, but we ended up making a great personal connection. So I think that sometimes homework can lead to greater relationships and social development. There's also times where you can do a study group. I know it's online now, so we've done it over Zoom, but some of us get together on Zoom and do homework together. Otherwise, I might just sit there and watch TV um, or talk to friends in a way that only enriches the social side, but not the academic side. Thank you both for giving us judges so much to consider. Wonderful. Okay, so that was a good judge's question. Very good. Agreed. All right, so now it's time for your closing statements. So we will start with the affirmative. So Jonah, whenever you're ready, go ahead and do your closing statement. I'm ready. I hope that you now understand why we should abolish homework for several reasons, as I've mentioned. I agree that children should live in a kid's world and doing homework and spending so much time focusing on homework creates stress. Also, if there is no homework, then you won't have as much stress and you won't be overwhelmed. If you do have homework, that's going to cause a lot of stress and you're going to be overwhelmed and that's not good. And I just want to reiterate family time. I've always thought that family is the most important thing in the world. And I think that we should always, always spend quality time with our family every day because this is a one-time experience and you aren't going to have them forever. It's not going to be an everyday thing. I grew up hating homework because I only had a little bit of time to play with my friends and I only had a little bit of time to participate in homework. I thought that only on the weekends could I have free time to play outside which I don't think is fair. I think that you should have time every day. And I have experienced all of those. Thank you. Good job, Jonah. Thank you, Jonah. Mateo, are you ready? I am. So now you understand why I support keeping homework in schools and not abolishing it. I think that one of the main things is that we need to remember that school was started to help students develop their confidence. Our current administration 
and the Secretary of Education, Miguel Cardona, is committed to educational reform to make sure that homework is distributed in an equitable way for everyone. For every student with, at different economic levels from different cultures, languages, or disabilities. The real purpose in mind is to help them support and reach their goals. I support homework because it will help students keep an open mind to open up our eyes to new worlds and more broader things. I have an appreciation of homework because it helped change my perspective. The second reason is that homework does prepare you for life. It teaches you organizational skills, budgeting skills, and it's an opportunity for us to make mistakes and learn that it's okay to make mistakes and just grow and learn from them and not give up when you make a mistake. And finally, Oh, I also wanted to add about that, that homework, again, reinforces what we've learned in class. So it ensures that we don't forget that 50% of what we learned in the class day. 59% of kids who do homework have greater GPAs than those who don't. And in this way, academic success is supported by homework. So we have more to benefit than we do to lose. Of course, athletics are very important. But I think that that can serve as a motivation to get your homework done so that you have more time to do extracurricular activities. I think students need to learn from homework and learn from other areas of life and not just be stressed out about whether they're going to get into college or what have you, but to learn from everything. And a key part of doing your homework is that it develops, helps you develop confidence, which is key for everything that we need in life. That's the main reason why homework began. We want to make sure that we grow into a better society and that we achieve our IEP goals and other goals that are part of our education. I think that having homework is a win-win for everyone, individually and societally. It means that we can all be on the same page. If you want your kids or family or whoever to be successful, I think that they should do homework. Thank you, Matea. Thank you both. That was a really good debate. So now you guys can turn your screens off and we'll wait for the judges to fill out their scoring sheet and then they'll come back and they'll discuss feedback. Oh, wow. I thought I was gonna be here by myself. <laughs> nope, I'm here. Okay, so now we are going to talk about the closing. What do you have to say about the positive side? Well, first, I wanna remember that, you know, this, this closing is about their heart. The affirmative argument was talking about homework is time consuming. There's not enough for extracurriculars, family time, the fact that 82% of students already feel overwhelmed with the work that they're doing. Parents are supportive of abolishing the homework, the, providing students more leisure time being very important. And on the negative side, there was a real focus on educational reform and our current secretary of education who recognizes that we need to reform education in many ways so that teachers and students have a better quality of life. And as was said, homework is really key to developing life skills that we need to learn to be good adults. Homework also is a way to level the playing field and help all students be successful. I think that's a good summary of the negative side. I think they both made great arguments for both sides. I keep forgetting too that I'm watching middle schoolers. They're just so incredible. I know I look back to me when I was in middle school and I was like, you know, of course, that was like eight years ago. Right. I won't share how many years ago it was for me when I was in middle school, but I will say this, that I was not that good when I was in middle school. <laughs> ah, thankfully, growth has happened. <laughs> So I'm curious, how much homework do you remember having when you were in middle school? A lot, a lot, a lot, really. Well, I'll keep my opinions on the matter to myself, actually. 
Yeah, I had a lot when I was in middle school also. I, we had the A, B, and C days. I'm not sure if you're familiar with what that system is. Yeah, we had those too. So a homework would be assigned and then be due two days later. So if, it was, it was a, if A days were on A's, were on Mondays and Wednesdays, homework assigned on Monday, due on Wednesday. Yeah, I felt, in my personal opinion, I felt like that structure really helped prepare me for college. Although looking back, I really hated that an hour and 20 minutes of class, but now in college, that's normal. Right. I mean, they're, you know, trade-offs though. And I think that there are uh, good points on both sides. There are some real benefits to abolishing homework, but then there's benefits to keeping it too. I think they both made equally compelling arguments as to what the benefits are of either keeping or abolishing homework. All right, let's check in with the judges and see if they are ready to give feedback. Judges, if you need more time, I'm kind of curious, which class did you hate the most, Aubrey? Hmm. Science. Science. Yeah, no, me and science do not mesh well. But, but I did love social studies. That was my favorite one. Yeah, world history. Well, okay, that makes sense considering both of us are government majors. <laughs> Yes, exactly. Yeah. So, you know, school does have its benefits, even though we didn't get along in every aspect. That's all I'll say. I will admit that I was in love with school growing up. I was one of those rare kids that loved school. I have really good memories from being in school growing up. Well, but now I can't get enough of it. And now I'm ready to be done. <laughs> oh, and I'm just the opposite. But I don't think that's going to be happening anytime soon. All right. Um, it seems like our judges need more time. Uh, so I guess that's a good thing because that means that our, the debate was so great that they are in the midst of a heated discussion session. And they expect to have wonderful feedback and getting good, getting a lot of feedback is not a bad thing. It's a good thing. It means that you can actually improve on something. If you can't improve, then that's actually bad news. Unless you're perfect. Or perfect. Yeah, we know that never happens in a debate. You would be surprised. Hmm. You'd be surprised. There are some people that really do come very close to being perfect. They're almost there. Yes, really there. Yeah, um, almost is the key word, almost. Their arguments are impenetrable sometimes. Well, I'm looking forward to the feedback. I keep, the feedback. I can't wait for the judges to come back on and give us their feedback. Me too. All right, it seems like they still need a few more minutes. Seems like it. All right, so tonight our judges are so, you know, in, in delved in the discussion of the feedback and what's happening and, oh, oh, okay. Here they are, speaking of the devils. <laughs> All right. Jonah, Mateo, you wanna come back on? All right, hello everyone again. I first wanna start by complimenting both of you. I'm so impressed with how focused you were on your topic and how respectful with one another and how professional and courteous you were. It was very impressive. And I wanna compliment both of you. You each deserve a pat on the back for the work that you've done. Thank you. 
This is Kim, and we as the judges are very impressed by how you all answered our question. You both had a good use of your statistics, your information, your data. It was very good. This is Zanab. You both did a fantastic job of balancing your knowledge with your experience, with your stories, in order to persuade the audience. This is Lexi. Excellent. Excellent. Do you have any other feedback that you'd like to add to our debaters? So if you're wondering who won, we actually have good news. We're not going to be announcing the winner until the very end of the debate. Because more good news, we have one more debate happening next. Great. So you are done with your portion. Please sit back and enjoy the next debate. Thanks. Good job, Jonah. Thank you. Good job with you as well. Okay. Well, that was good feedback. And that was a good debate. As I mentioned earlier, if you missed it, you don't have to worry we're going to announce the winners for the middle school debate at the end of the event tonight the sad part is that we only have one more debate left for this year's debate bowl we are going to have sirhabi gangdhar from adali e stevenson high school who will be arguing that the voting age should be lowered to 16 years old. Sir Habi will be competing against Marissa Guintoli from the Texas School for the Deaf. Marissa will be trying to justify why the, the voting age should not be lowered. We'd like to invite our debaters to please come and introduce themselves along with their image description. And please don't forget to answer the poll for this particular debate. Hello. Hi there. Hi, my Hi. name is Hi, my name is Surabi. I am from Adonai Stevenson. I'm a junior right now. Um, my I'm wearing a light purple sweatshirt. My background is a white wall. Great, thank you. Marissa, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Hi, my name is Marissa Giantoli. I'm 16, I'm from Texas. I'm wearing a gray jacket on top of a white t-shirt. I'm a white female with um, blonde hair pulled into a bun seated in front of a white wall. Great, thank you both. I really appreciate you both being here with us this evening to debate. We're really excited to see your debating skills. Are you both ready? Yes. Okay, then the stage is all yours. Okay, so we will start with the affirmative debater, which is, which is Sarabi. So if you're ready. In the past year, America has witnessed the COVID-19 pandemic economic turmoil, the Black Lives Matter movement. Despite these challenges, we saw increased participation from the teams who play key roles in protesters and organizations. Due to the increased participation of the American youth, I urge that the voting age should be reduced to 16, as because our government already treats these teenagers as adults and will result in an increased voter turnout and active political participation. Our American government already treats our teenagers as adults through our laws and policies. My teens under 18 aren't allowed to work full time, apply for a credit card, or participate in jury duty according to the Fair Labor Standard Act. They can hold in jobs as early as 14 and legally pay taxes as soon as they start earning. Additionally, according to the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, in 2020, 16 to 17 year old teenagers made up 19.6 of the employed civilian force, which is more than the 15.5% reported back in 2017. 
Therefore, it is safe to conclude that we must take these themes in consideration because they have the potential to be impacted by our employment and uh, taxation reforms. Secondly, I would like to point out that the minors under 18 can be criminally charged with adults. According to the conference of state legislature, every single state in this country allows for minors to be prosecuted as adults for their serious offenses. In fact, in New Jersey, 90% of these minors were prosecuted as adults. Lowering the voting age to 16 will encourage voter turnout and political participation. According to our history, in 1960s, as a result of the Vietnam War, young people across America were engaged in actions against racial oppression and other injustices. In the end, these courageous efforts by young activists resulted in the 26th Amendment, which effectively lowered the voting age to 18 from 21. This resulted in a high voter turnout in the election of 1972. So if we were to do the same thing today, we would also see a high voter turnout in the next election. Today, as a young generation, we are motivated to participate in our government because we struggle against crippling student jobs, employment problems, and climate change. According to Circle, we it was calculated that in the election of 2020, 52 um, to 55% of young voters voted in the last election, compared to the 42 to 44% who voted in 2016. Therefore, I conclude that voting age should be lowered to 16 because our government already treats these youths as adults under the law. The act will also increase voter turnout and political participation as it would encourage you to be more civically engaged. Lastly, I would like to remind you that our 16 year olds should vote in the government because they are more likely to be living under these regulations that we passed today and in the future for a longer duration compared to the older generation, thereby exposing them to a higher degree of impact. Thank you so much. Good job. Great, good job. Thank you, Sarabi. All right, next we'll go to Marissa for your opening statements. Should I start now or? Yeah, cool. Good evening. I'm Marissa and I'm here today to explain that I strongly oppose lowering the voting age to 16. 16 year olds are still the legal responsibility of their parents. Parents are the ones that take care of all their needs. So 16 year olds don't need to vote because all their needs are taken care of. When I asked my junior year classmates what their priorities were, the most common answers were friends, sports, and homework. These are not things that voting has any impact on. Psychologicalhealthcare.org said adults think and worry the most about money, their future, jobs, relationships, and health. And another example, students really give in to peer pressure. We had a class election for class president at my school, and I saw how the students really just asked each other who they were going to vote for. They only gave in to peer pressure. They didn't take it seriously. And I think that this shows that we're not mature enough to really vote at age 16. Additionally, the University of Rochester Medical Center says that the rational part of our brains are not fully developed until the age 25. This is the area that controls our emotions and judgment. So it's important that we have good judgment when exercising the right to vote. This research shows that we're not ready for that decision at that point. Moreover, at my school, we don't even take government or economics until senior year. At that point, most of us are gonna be 18 years old and will be educated by the time we get the opportunity to vote. Some might have taken it at 15 or 16, but it's better to start that responsibility at age 18. There's laws for 16 year olds like driving, and we know that there are higher rates of accidents among younger people than there are in adults. However, the responsibility of driving for younger people is also balanced by limitations like driving curfews or um, needing driver's ed. And car insurance is also way higher for teenagers because of these accident rates. So we're not quite independent enough to do adult things or make adult decisions. So for example, according to the CDC, the leading deaths of teenagers are car accidents. We also are susceptible to smoking and other types of peer pressure. We're not so independent, but voting is an independent individual act. And we need to take that decision seriously. Teenagers are not independent. We're not responsible enough. And we don't have the decision-making abilities to do something as important as voting. I think it's better to give us that additional two more years and make sure that we are 18 by the time we vote. At 16, we're still really on the cusp of childhood. We still need those time, that time to enjoy our childhood and vote when we're 18. Thank you. Great. Thank you both for your opening statements. 
And so now we're gonna go back to Sarabi for your rebuttal. Are you ready? Yes. I would like to address the claims that Marisa made, which includes that she, which includes the 16 year olds are not responsible, are mature enough. First, she does have some points. However, I would like to argue that in the past year, with all the crisis that we have faced, we have also seen 16 year olds and even older have taken initiative to advocate for the issues that are deeply concerned. For example, I observed youth my age and even older still support and shooting to the Black Lives Matter movement, um, advocating for these issues through protesters and the various uh, and creating various organizations or even simple advocacy on social media. And I may say that, uh, although Marissa says that it is not necessary for teenagers to vote now, even if they are involved in these protesters and organizations, I believe that I should remind you that it is essential that we become involved in the voting because we are becoming more concerned about the various issues since we know that we are more likely to get impacted by the laws and regulations that are being created for a longer duration. I have observed that my peers and myself have been participating in these political issues such as climate change, gun violence, LGBTQ uh, activist rights and all that because we are concerned about where our society is going, we are concerned about where our government is going. Yes, Marisa does mention that uh, the act of 2018 years old is a way of uh, be, I mean, reaching adulthood where you are at that position to be appropriately. However, I would like to remind you that if it's that's that case, then why are 16 year olds treated as adults under our government, under the law? Why are we treated as adults? If uh, we are treated as uh, adults, then shouldn't we also have the right to decide the laws that we are being uh, prosecuted and that we are supposed to follow when we drive cars and everything um, because we need to decide these laws that decide oh, how much taxes we are supposed to pay, what kind of jobs we can pay, um, and even how we are supposed to be tried. Therefore, I firmly would argue that the voting age should be reduced to 16 because we are already being treated as adults. We are already exposed to the laws that the others at 18 years and above are exposed to. And therefore, shouldn't we also deserve the same respect um, by given, being given the voting rights, just like our 18 year old counterparts, just as we are being treated and we are also fully matured as we have already understood the seriousness of the political issues that we are being exposed to and uh, how we are already advocating for them despite the right not to vote. And therefore, just having the ability to vote will actually cement our ability to get our voice out there to actually create an impact on the future society and on our futures. Thank you. Thank you, Sarabi. Now we'll have the negative rebuttal. Marissa, are you ready? And I get three minutes for this, right? Yes, that's three minutes. The Parkland shooting was done committed by a teenager, which shows that we aren't responsible enough. In citing statistics about driving, there are limitations imposed on the driving of 16 year olds by the government because of the rate of accidents. So there is a recognition that we're not quite responsible enough to have the full responsibility of driving. While there are many things that we can do, every law is individual. We need to create a baseline that is a foundation and a standard age. So for example, 18 year old being 18 is a baseline for knowing that that's when you become a legal adult and you then have adult responsibilities. Of course, there are outliers and some 18 year olds that aren't responsible enough and others that are younger enough or younger than that, that might be responsible, but we need to base our laws based on the majority of people. As another example, some laws are made about 16 year olds and it's, it sets limitations. So for example, we're not independent and we can't do everything because we're still our parents' responsibility. Okay. So now, thank you, Marissa. We're going to take a short break, give our debaters a few moments to prepare for our crossfire. So you have a minute and 30 seconds, you can turn your videos off. Hey, Lexi. 
Hey, hello again. Hello, my long lost friend. Hmm. Well, um, honestly, I am just so very impressed with our debaters this evening. Um, what an amazing time to be alive. I mean, looking back on my, I really think that we've had some great debaters this evening. I'm at a loss for words. That's how amazing this has been with me for me. I can't, I can't agree with you more. Really, it's amazing just to watch them. And you know, that's the whole reason we, we set up this debate bowl was to give opportunities and to give space to encourage our young deaf people all over the country in order to develop those debating skills. Who knows? They'll be replacing us one day at Gallaudet debate team. And once we graduate, we'll be passing the torch. These students could be our legacy and, and we are paving, paving the way. And I look forward to that day. Oh, now it's time for the crossfire questions. Again, I think this is one of the most exciting parts of every debate. I think it's the toughest part of the, date, the, the debate is to come up with these questions. It is, it is. Okay, so again, each debater is going to ask a question of the other. They'll have a minute and 30 seconds to respond. And with that, we will now ask our debaters to come back on screen. Hello, Hello. Marissa. Hello, Sarabi. Okay, are we ready for the crossfire? Do I ask the first question? So the first question is actually going to be from Marissa to Sarabi. Why do governments create the rules that they do for 18 year olds? For example, being able to get tattoos or own firearms. Why do you think that that's the age they've set for those things? Can I repeat, why do the governments create rules for teenagers to get tattoos? Why does the government create age limits for those different things? So I gave the example of tattoos, um, but also the ability to own a firearm. You have to be at least 18 years old. Why is that the age limit that government set? I believe that it's uh, some sort of hypocrisy by the government because we are tried by the laws that are same for adults. We are sort of exposed to the same taxation laws, employment laws, uh, which adults are exposed to. So I believe that uh, the government creating these certain age limits is their way of saying, okay, because these teenagers have done it, it's probably this. But to be honest, if you if the government wholly believes that 16 year old people like me are not fully responsible, then why do you give us the give us the rules to have a certain tax to pay certain taxes to join a job at this age and all these things? when they are really this restrict our limits to certain things. However, I believe that if we had the chance to vote, we would also be thinking appropriately and vote certainly. Thank you for your response. Now, Sarabi, you'll have the opportunity to ask Marissa a question. If we don't have the full responsibility to drive or act on our own because we are under our parents' jurisdiction, then why would you say that we are being treated under others as under the law, especially when it comes to trials? That's a good question. I think that the reason we do that is because we're not mature enough. And as I said, we don't have that part of our brain area that's or that part of our brain is not fully developed yet. So we don't have appropriate decision-making skills. And I think that's why sometimes we get charged for severe crimes. Thank you both for your answers. So we'll take another short break to give our judges some time to prepare their questions for you all. Hi again, Lexi, my long lost friend. All right. 
All right. So I think that was a tough crossfire session. Yes. Yes. I think both of them brought up some very valid points. I mean, there were some very valid holes in each of their arguments that they brought up, and I think they answered them well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. If I were in their shoes, I would have been sweating bullets for sure. Yeah. And that was a, that was a real knife <laughs> that would have punctured my argument. So you're just talking about two different kinds of weapons in one statement. Hey, you know, I mean, I can get away with anything. Can I, I'm on the debate team. So in the name of the debating, LOL. All right. Judges, you can appear whenever you're ready to ask a question of each debater. I think they might need a few more moments. Okay, we'll give you some more time. So, Lexi, um, so our judges have to assess, uh, we have three judges, two of whom are from the NAD and one represents NBDA. Did you know that NBDA was established to advocate for every black individual, regardless of their or our, oh, here they are. Oh, well, that was good. Saved by the bell, right? <laughs> right, okay, judges, do you have questions for our debaters? All right, let's invite the debaters back. All right, hello. So this question is for Sarabi. You argued that because 16 year olds are, are, are protesting because they're exposed to the laws that are voted on without them. What about 13 year olds? And they are involved in protests about laws that apply to them. Do you support lowering the age to potentially 13? And if not, why? I would like, um, that's actually a very good question. Um, however, I would like to restate that um, 16 year olds are exposed to these laws because they're exposed to the world more as they're going to high school where they may be provided with these uh, government classes, social studies classes that may cover the history and um, society in a more broader depth compared to the education that 13 year old receives. Therefore, I would start the advocate for the voting age to be reduced to 16, not 13. Um, as to also point out that the 16 year olds are more in the world because they can get jobs um, as soon as they turn 16, start driving or even pay taxes and all the other things which uh, 13 year olds are not able to do. And um, since uh, they, according to the standards act, only people older than 14 can get jobs and 13 is in really at that age to do so. Therefore, I would like to say 16 is probably at this state because they're more um, exposed to society in that sense. Thank you. Great, thank you, Sarabi. Now, Marissa, you're arguing for a baseline and you are suggesting that there should be based on mental cognition and cognitive abilities and independence. Evidence shows that your brain is not actually fully developed until about the age of 30. And an 18 year old who still lives with their parents often. So if you're a fan, uh, would you be a fan of raising the voting age to 30? Why or why not? Could you restate the question? Sure, so you were argu arguing, and that's what you said, was talking about that baseline for voting. And so based on what? was the cognitive abilities and independence. However, evidence shows that brains are not fully developed until around age 30. And there, and some 18 year olds are still living with their parents. So therefore, would you support raising the voting age to 30? Why or why not? I'm not in support of raising it to age 30, but I am in support of a baseline. I think 18 year olds know that there is a certain age at which they are expected to leave home and it is their right to leave home at that time, whether they actually choose to or not. And in terms of a baseline, it also means that they know that this is when they get adult responsibilities and privileges and they can make decisions for themselves, regardless of what their parents think. And I think that even though 16 and 18 is only two chronological years, it's a really important time for our growth. 
We learn a lot in school in those last two years of high school, and we go through a lot of late adolescent experiences. The law recognizes that that's the age at which we are legal adults, and that's when we get the right to vote, because that's also when we get the right to start going out and living in the world on our own. All right, well, thank you, judges. So now we are at the end, the final quarter. We'll have each of you give your closing statements. I will have the interpreter come back on for Sarabi. Ignore, ignore that other person that popped on. <laughs> so, Sarabi, if you could please go ahead and present your closing statement. In summary, I urge that the voting age should be lowered to 16, considering the fact that many teenagers under 18 are being treated as adults under the law and are becoming more politically engaged, which can result in a high voter turnout. While Marissa argues the opposite, I would like to take this moment to remind you that 2020 has taught us a lot about the younger generation. We have witnessed teenagers in Guinea take a stance upon the important issues uh, such as Black Lives Matter, LGBTQ rights, gun violence, job employment, climate change, and many more. While Marissa does take the moment to say that teenagers has the right to be prosecuted for severe offenses under the adult law. I want to point out that if Marissa claims that the teenagers uh, have unfinished brain development, then shouldn't they be tried under a more lenient law that takes their unstable brain development into consideration when giving out punishments? Additionally, I want to honey, I want to remind you all that the younger generation has become more willing to actively participate in the government in the manner of causing an impact which can only happen during a vote. I believe that the younger generation deserves a voice in the government because the policies and the laws that are passed and will be passed in the future will impact the younger generation, including me, for a longer duration. We have the right to decide on how we would like to be impacted by these gener by these laws. Yes. I do understand that we can cause change through organizations or protesters or other movements. However, these types of actions may create legislation, but the legislation is something that lies in the power of the people over 18 who can vote, which means that they have the power to override the efforts and hard work that we put in to create these changes in our government and in our country. Therefore, I feel that if we had the right to vote at the age of 16, then we could make sure that our efforts and our well-intentioned hard work is put into reality in the form of a law that could be immediately put into effect for the government. Lastly, before I end this uh, statement, I want to say that by voting to raise the age to 16, I will be giving a voice to the thousands of 16-year-old uh, and uh, the younger generation who would be willing to create a future, increasing their participation in the government, resulting in a high voter turnout and increased civic engagement. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sarabi. Now, Marissa, are you ready for your closing statement? I'd like to emphasize what I said in my opening statement, which is that teenagers are not yet independent. We are still legally under the um, responsibility of our parents. And I think for that same reason, we can't make such an important choice like voting independently. When we are given responsibilities like driving, we don't exercise it appropriately and we have a high rate of accidents. You mentioned that some young people are tried as adults, but I think that if they're responsible for it, then they should be tried appropriately. We also have not had enough education by age 16, and education is such an important part of voting. That's one of the most important parts of voting. I think that if adults were to allow 16-year-olds to vote, they would regret it because they see and they know how much more we have to grow. I think once we're 18, then we're more stable, we have more of a baseline, and we understand the rights and responsibilities that are part of being an adult. And that brief two years can really show big changes in our decision-making and our cognitive skills. Also, remember that we're still children at 16 and we still need to enjoy that childhood. I think that if we 
have the right to vote at 16, then we're going to increase the amount of stress that we feel in the middle of our teenage years. But at 18, that's a baseline that we look to and we prepare for our adult responsibilities as we approach age, as we approach age 18. I think it's important that we enjoy our childhood. And that's part of why I do not support lowering the voting age to 16. It should remain at 18. Thank you, Marissa. Good job, Sarabi. Good job. Yeah. Good job, Sarabi. I'm sorry for messing up the spelling of your name. I apologize. You all can turn your screens off for a little while while we wait for the judges to fill out their scoring brackets. Both the middle school and high school winners will be announced soon. Go ahead and turn your screens off. Yeah. While we're waiting, please fill out the poll and let us know how you feel regarding this debate and our debaters and have their debates changed your mind in these areas. And I will wait for our esteemed host, both the youth program director, Jesse Saunders and Dr. Brandon Stern to come and talk a little bit more about what's going to happen now. Hi, Aubrey. Hello, Jess. Hello, Jesse. How are you? I'm sweating a little bit, but I'm good. I can imagine. Honestly, I am just blown away by both sets of debaters. Uh, this has been great, both tonight and then at the semifinals this past Monday, they both were just outstanding. Um, and I can't say this enough, but I am just so absolutely delighted that CDDA and Dr. Brendan Stern specifically suggested the idea of having this event in the youth programs um, center. We have a number of things available to young people, but this is a great and exciting addition. Uh, Dr. Stern asked that we add something that really promotes critical thinking skills, presentation skills, and this event really, this competition hit both of those goals. So thank you so much, Dr. Stern, for reaching out to us. I'm certain that this will be a permanent fixture in the lineup of youth programs or on our youth programs calendar. Now, debating isn't the only thing that we do in youth programs, as you might have guessed. We do offer a number of programs. The longest running program in our selection of activities is the Academic Bowl. Um, side note, Brent and I both have something in common. We both played for the same school not in the same year, but for the same school. And you and I also informally debated, I think throughout our entire high school career. We did, we've known each other for quite some time. Um, I'm a bit older than Brendan. And I would say that my argumentation skills may be a bit superior, but <laughs> I can say, well, back then. Um, that's now, that's debatable. <laughs> I'm not gonna get into that and say anything. So going back to the academic bowl, it's really an outstanding opportunity for those who have a strong academic drive as it covers a number of academic categories, math, literature, science and technology, entertainment, current events. It really runs the gamut. So for those who have a deep enjoyment of learning, not just learning facts or trivia, that's not just what this is about. I'd encourage you that when you are studying, of course, facts and trivia is something to consider, but if you find yourself looking for more information because you something piques your interest, like those times that we look on Wikipedia and sort of go into a rabbit hole on a certain topic, that right there is the kind of joy of learning that we know that our academic, particip academic bowl participants exemplify. You can play as part of a school for deaf students, or you can play as part of a mainstream school. If a team is not an option at your school, please do reach out and we can work to make something happen. We can help create a team in your area. Another event is the Battle of the Books. This is for middle schoolers. This is also a competition that encourages reading and also helps to stimulate the love of reading in middle schoolers. And it also promotes critical thinking, teamwork, coordination, cooperation, study skills, presentation skills, all in one event. Matea and Jonah, are both uh, both of our middle school debaters this evening. 
also have been on Battle of the Books teams and their presentation experiences there, I believe helped them tonight. I think it was noticeable. Those are our two largest programs for high schooler and middle schoolers, but we also have a new trivia cup that's available for elementary, middle, and high school students. I believe Brendan's youngest is involved in that. Yeah, and he loves it. Oh, how cool. So we started the Trivia Cup just this year, you know, with the number of schools that were now engaged in virtual learning, we figured we needed to make some kind of competition that would be fun and have a variety of themes to interest our students. So more information will be shared on our website about that. We'll offer that next year as well. And we'll also put information on Facebook. I do wanna mention one final program, the National Literary Competition. This promotes presentation skills, both in ASL and writing skills. This is for middle schoolers and high schoolers. Some elementary students can be involved at the in the ASL competition. You can find more information about this on our online, youthprograms.gallaudet.edu. I'll put the link on Facebook tonight as well. All right, Bren, did you have any additional thoughts to share? I do. Before I share my thoughts, I have to thank you, Jesse, and the Gallaudet Youth Program for being a co-host for this event tonight. It wouldn't be possible without your help. I also need to thank, thank NBDA and NAD for sponsoring this event. I also want to recognize Aubrey and Lexi, not only for the facilitating job that you did tonight, which was wonderful, but you're also student assistants for our our debate team and they have been organizing this event for a long time so I really want to recognize the two of you for your outstanding work. Thank you. And I'm also here as the head coach of our debate team at Gallaudet and seeing tonight's debaters was really inspiring. Uh, the middle school and the high school debaters really had such eloquence and intelligence and confidence and if this is what our future looks like I think that we are in good shape. Definitely. If you out there in the audience enjoyed the event tonight, which I'm sure that you did, I highly encourage that you participate in next week's event. Gallaudet is going to actually have it our first ever intercollegiate bilingual debate that happens next Wednesday night. And we are our going up against our in-town rival, George Washington University, and the debate topic will be if DC should be awarded statehood. Oh, that'll be an exciting topic. Yes, very timely. So if you are curious, if you'd like to cheer us on, please do so. That will be next Wednesday at seven o'clock. We will also be streaming it live on Gallaudet's Facebook page. I also think that seeing tonight's debate, I'm sure like I did, you all have really appreciated the beauty of debate. I think Jesse, you mentioned that it does teach critical thinking skills. It teaches presentation skills and it encourages uh, minority success. And I think that it really does teach important components of social change. And so I do want to share a very fa famous Irish playwright who said, progress is not possible without change, which means those who do not change their minds cannot change anything. So with that in mind, I'd like to check in with our audience. Have their minds changed? So we had a, a poll on Facebook. We had a pre and post poll before each of the two debates, and I am going to share the results with you all now. It's very interesting. The first question of if homework should be abolished in middle school, the pre debate poll said that 54% of our audience said that yes, it should. And 46% said no. After the debate, we asked the same question. And interestingly enough, 26% of the audience said yes, and 84% said no. Wow. Very interesting. Now for the second debate, the high school debate, the question that we asked before the debate started is, should the voting age be lowered to 16? The pre-debate results said 33% said yes, and 67% said no. Post the debate, 39 said yes, so that increased, and 61 said no, so that decreased. Not bad, not bad. Interesting. 
I want to thank our audience for participating and answering the poll. And I'm very curious to see what the judges have to say if they themselves have changed their opinions and if that aligns with what our audience has felt. So thank you uh, for your participation in the audience and our judges. All right, so on that note, we're gonna call our judges to come on back screen with us. Hello, judges. Okay, so I'd also like to ask all of our debaters to come back on screen. Debaters, we're ready for you. All right, so where are you, Matea? I don't see you, Matea. Matea, ah, there you are. Hello. Hi, sorry. This is Kim. Before we announce the winners, we wanna give a little bit of feedback to our high school debaters. You all were very compelling and you obviously gave a lot of thought to your debate and a lot of facts. You were both very strong about your stances. This is Zinab. Also, you were both very for, firm with your positions. There was no wavering. And you both made good use of analogies in order to use your argument as convincing. So Isidore is having some technical difficulties, but we have him on another screen and I'm gonna go ahead and let you know what he's saying. So this is from Isidore. I really want to thank both of you high school debaters. Again, I was very impressed with your debate. The points that you made were very clear. Most importantly, you were respectful as citizens, not just about your rights, but also about the greater responsibilities. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so this is Kim. Are you all ready to know who the winners were for each category? So for the middle school category, the judges, we went back and forth and talked and wavered. There was a lot of good perspectives that were thrown out there. And we decided to choose Jonah as the winner. Congratulations. Congratulations. For our high school debaters, we also had a deep discussion. There was a lot of thought put into it. Um, Sarabi had a very heavy responsibility that of what she brought to this argument and it was very thought provoking. And so we'd like to congratulate Sarabi for winning tonight's debate for the high school. Congratulations, good job Sarabi. So congratulations both of you. You did a phenomenal job. Thank you all for your wonderful debate. And now I'd like to invite our moderators back onto screen. Hi, everyone. So with that, our program has officially concluded. This is the end of the very first Youth Acad uh, Debate Bowl. I think that all of our debaters did a phenomenal job this evening, don't you, Alexa? Absolutely. Congratulations to our winners. Um, really, congratulations to all of you. In our hearts, you're all winners. All four of you did a fantastic job, and I look forward to seeing you back again next year at our next Youth Debate Bowl. Judges, I thank all three of you for being a part of this for your time, your energy, your efforts, and I appreciate your time with our event. I agree completely, 100%. Please do try out again. I know I'm always looking for more competition. So as soon as someone's ready to debate with me, send me an email. Okay, 
Again, I would like to thank each and every one of you young people for being involved this evening and also giving your other students out there an opportunity to look up to people their own age. Again, thank you to um, everyone involved in putting on tonight's event, our judges, our supporters, sponsors, people behind the scenes, our moderators, Lexi, thank you. Thank you, Aubrey, you too. Um, and last but not least, thank you to our audience for tuning in tonight. Thank you for making time this evening. Stay safe, stay strong, stay beautiful. <laughs>